Moramai, good morning. This is Judith Lay welcoming you to Manx Radio and to the podcast of this week's edition of At Your Service. Manx Radio. During lockdown, when we were all doing our best to cope with being cut off from our normal routines, I invited you to choose your favourite hymns to be included in the programme, and I had some really touching responses. All the hymn choices were good, one or two were new to me, and some were requested by folk living thousands of miles away and keen to keep in some contact with their Manx roots. Well, happily, that way of life is behind us now, but I just thought I'd remind you that you're still most welcome to choose a favourite hymn to start the programme. It might be one that holds some special memories for you, or you might want to dedicate a hymn to someone you know who needs to know that they're in your thoughts. The easiest way is to email me, judithlay at manxradio.com, all at lowercase with no spaces and lay is spelt L-E-Y. I do hope I'll hear from you. I seem to remember that this hymn was the choice of Mrs Anne Jones, who lived for a time in Laxey and now listens to us online at her home in Brightlingsea in Essex. Based on the words of Psalm 104, here's the choir of Norwich Cathedral to sing O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. Earlier this week, we heard that Reverend Canon Brendan Alger had died peacefully at his home in Onken after a period of illness that he bore with considerable courage. Canon Brendan will be well remembered by many as parish priest of St Mary of the Isle Roman Catholic Church on Hill Street here in Douglas. He began his ministry there and his role as Dean or Area Leader of the Island's Catholics in 1989 and retired in January 2011. Originally from Merseyside, he chose to stay on the island and lived out his retirement in Onken, where he made full use of modern technology to keep in contact with friends, family and brother priests all around the world. During his years of ministry, Canon Brendan took every opportunity to work with churches of other denominations, and St Mary's was often the host for all-island ecumenical celebrations. And even when the service was marking an essentially Catholic event or anniversary, he would include representatives from other churches and the wider community. 
Here's just one example from my archive. The year is 2006 and St Mary's is hosting a service to celebrate 100 years of the Catholic Women's League, an international organisation that to this day works in friendship and love on projects to benefit anyone in need. Reporting on the service, this is what I said on this exact date, the 2nd of July, in the year 2006. The music is by St Mary's Choir, conducted by Mr Tom Walsh, with organist Mr Ken Radcliffe. Margaret Fletcher was born in Oxford in the mid-1800s. A graduate of the Slade School of Art in Chelsea, she went on to launch a quarterly magazine called The Crucible, which was aimed at teachers to raise awareness of the need for better social education for women. In 1906, when she was at a National Catholic Conference in Brighton, she distributed leaflets about the formation of a League for Catholic Women. Seventy women came to the first meeting, made Margaret Fletcher their president, and so established the Catholic Women's League, which celebrates the 100th anniversary of its foundation this year. At the time of its formation, it was said that the League needs women with balanced common sense, who would use business-like methods and intellectual gifts as excellent weapons in the service of God. The Ireland branch of Catholic Women's League celebrated the centenary year recently with a special Mass of Thanksgiving in the Church of St Mary of the Isle in Douglas. Canon Brendan Alger celebrates the Mass and preaches a sermon. Catholic Women's League members were also delighted to welcome His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor, Vice Admiral Sir Paul and Lady Haddocks, together with the Chief Minister, the Speaker of the House of Keys, the Worshipful, the Mayor and Mayoress of Douglas, and representatives of government and of other Christian denominations, including the Lord Bishop of Soda and Man, the Right Reverend Graham Knowles and Mrs Knowles. Century after century has seen a story of growth, decline, renewal, revival, different modes of presenting the message, the central message of the person of Jesus and the Father's love for all of us. When Pope Benedict assumed his position, he said, the purpose of our lives is to reveal God to men. And only where God is seen does life truly begin. Only when we meet the living God in Christ do we know what life is. We're not some casual, meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed, each of us is loved, each of us is necessary. There is nothing more beautiful than the encounter with Christ. There's nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. We all have that calling, but we find great support in one another. But over the centuries, that support's been seen in a whole variety of movements. In the 19th century, in Britain, there's so much hardship, so much change, so much poverty, and a whole variety of movements the religious communities began. New religious orders, not enclosed, but working in the city, in the rural districts, opening up schools as universal education came in. Mary Sumner, in the 1870s, saw a need for the Mother's Union women to have a more active place in the life of their families, 
in the life of church, in the life of country. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Catholic Church appreciated very much the work of the Mother's Union, and a whole host of new movements began for us. Catholics were becoming more active. There's much more work to be done together with social nature. Public offices to be filled, the church to be represented. And it was amazing how in those early years of the last century, 1906, the Catholic Women's League, 1930, the Union of Catholic Mothers, 1912, the Cotinian Order, founded for men. 1924, the Knights of St. Columba. And they flourished. People were surprised that working together, they could take on issues, problems, all those things that needs doing in the name of Christ to love others. They could do it together, fed by the word of God, but in companionship, meeting Jesus, presenting Jesus to the world. There's still work to be done. And in countless new movements, old traditions are taken on board to face the issue of today and what is the message of the risen Christ today's world and how it's deeply presented. Organizations come and go, but the work of Jesus if we open our eyes, we'll be surprised how people are responding. We have members of the Catholic Women's League here from the island today. Thankfully, we have a representative from across, Anne Donna, who is very welcome. But our biggest community in our church in this island, I could say, are three groups which were unheard of, unheard of, 1960. And that is those who minister, those who minister the Eucharist far outnumber the membership of societies, those who are readers of the word at worship, and those who continue that activity very much done by the Catholic Women's League of teaching the young. And thankfully, we have a new movement on the island, Couples for Christ, another Singles for Christ, over one million members of Couples for Christ, young couples. I think we have to pray with thanks, yes, for what's been achieved, what's been preserved, the tradition, the message. We have to welcome the fact that there's new opportunities and be thankful that the older organizations are grasping it, doing new tasks. It is perhaps blunt to say that saying of Mother Teresa, yesterday's gone, tomorrow isn't here. Let's begin with today. With music from St Mary's Choir and a sermon preached as the Catholic Women's League celebrated their centenary, that recording, made in 2006, pays tribute to Reverend Canon Brendan Alger, who died recently. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Canon Brendan was a great historian with a passion for research and learning that never left him and a true teacher's gift of passing on his knowledge in an easy and accessible way. The lives and influences of the Celtic saints were one of his many interests and with this in mind I thought it would be appropriate to include some stories and music about Lindisfarne, Holy Island, a major centre of early Christianity. Singer-songwriter Andrew Lobb and much-loved author David Adam, who for many years was the vicar of Holy Island, will share first the story of the wild geese, followed by just one of the many stories about Bishop Aidan, the first bishop of Lindisfarne. 
In the early 7th century, the Northumbrian king, Oswald, summoned an Irish monk named Aidan to leave his monastery on the island of Iona to become bishop of King Oswald's kingdom. Oswald granted Bishop Aidan the small island of Lindisfarne, Holy Island, on which to found a monastery. In the years that followed, it became one of the most important centres of early English Christianity. And as you'll hear, King Oswald and Bishop Aidan became, after a few misunderstandings, good friends. But first, a prayer of dedication from Ray Simpson, founder of a retreat house on the holy island of Lindisfarne. I give you assent with all my being. I give you affection with all my senses. I give you worship with all my mind. I give you joy with all my frame. I bow my knees before you. I still my heart before you. I am yours and I will be yours every day of my life. And all I have to give, I give to you today. And all I have to say, I say to you today. And all I have to feel, I feel for you today. Today. And everything I do, I do for you today. And everything I see, I see for you today. And everything I want, I want for you today. Today. Because you are my Island, it feels like being at the beginning of creation. In a sense, each day is new. But when the fog is lifting and the sun appearing, when there are great flocks of birds in the sky, when the seals are singing and the curlews are calling, it is very special indeed. On one such day, I watched a wonderful flight of wild geese going over in a V formation. It seemed they were urging the leader on with their cries. I thought, how clever, how cooperative. By flying in a V, each bird was in the slip stream of the bird in front. It has been calculated by flying in such a formation, the geese can increase their range by as much as 70% over a bird that flies alone. This must teach us something about teamwork and the ability to share. 
When the lead bird tires, it drops further back in the formation and lets another goose take the lead. This helps to keep a better pace and is not dependent on one bird alone. Once again, we could learn from such actions. Shared leadership is important. We need to know when to take the lead and when to hand it over. In flight, the geese actually take advantage of the lifting power of the bird ahead. There are times when we need to follow a leader and take advantage of the work they've already done. I'm told that when a goose falls out of formation due to fatigue or illness, two other geese will fall out with it, support it and protect it. They will stay with the goose until it sets off again or until it dies. I've only heard this from one person, but I would like to think that it is so. It tells of a sense of community and duty, as well as care and protection. I feel we've got a lot to learn from the wild geese and from the other creatures that are about us. Lindisfarne was forever giving things away. If he was given money, he gave it to the poor, or he bought slaves and then set the slaves free. There was one occasion when Aidan was given a very fine horse. This was by King Oswin. So the trappings were of the best. The harness, the saddle were all very beautiful and very expensive. Aidan actually liked to travel on foot, but he felt because he had the horse, he would have to ride. Having a horse in the days of Aidan was like having a very expensive car, and it set Aidan aside from the ordinary people, so he was not too happy that he was riding. Not long afterwards he met a very poor man who asked for arms. The bishop immediately dismounted and ordered the horse, with all its royal trappings, to be given to the beggar. This shows you how compassionate and caring Aidan was. Later, when the king heard of what the bishop had done, he said, My lord bishop, Aidan, why did you give away a royal horse which was necessary for you to use? Why did you give it to a beggar? Have we not less valuable horses that you could give them to him? Aidan answered, What are you saying, your majesty? Is this horse more valuable to you than the child of God? 
the king felt quite rebuked. Later he begged forgiveness from Aden, but he did say, I will not refer to this matter again, nor will I inquire how much of what you are given you give away to God's children. Aden was deeply moved. He stood up and asked the king to rise to his feet and assured him of his high regard and begged him to sit down with him to eat. At the bishop's request, the king and he sat down together. And you who lack a voice inside With nothing left to say Lift up your hearts to Aidan And feel his blessings today And if your soul is in poverty With nothing left to give Lift up your hands to Aidan and feel his blessings and take his strength to live. Tracing our Christian past in stories from the holy island of Lindisfarne in the company of David Adam, Andrew Lobb and Ray Simpson. And now it's time to take a look at our notice board and we start with services later today. Begaro Methodist Chapel celebrate their anniversary with a service this afternoon at half past two. Mrs Pauline Corlett will be preaching. There'll be musical items from the summer singers and a warm welcome for everyone. Also this afternoon, Bride Methodist Church celebrate their Sunday school anniversary with a service starting at four o'clock. It'll be led by Mrs Jen Casson. The Sunday school children will take part and it'll be followed by afternoon tea. And this evening, the Mariners Choir will be in St Luke's Church in Baldwin for a service with Reverend Canon Janice Ward, starting at the usual time of half past six and followed by supper and community hymn singing. Tomorrow, Monday the 3rd, it's another Super Monday in the lounge at Colby Methodist Church. Pop in between noon and half past one for homemade soup and fresh bread, followed by tea or coffee. There's no charge, but donations to cover costs would be very welcome. On Tuesday the 4th, there's a coffee morning in Port Erin Methodist Church on Station Road. The kettle will be boiling between 10 and half past 11. Because it's Tinwell Day on Wednesday, there's no concert in St Thomas's Church here in Douglas this Wednesday evening. The summer concerts resume in St Thomas's next Wednesday evening, July the 12th. And because it's our National Day on Wednesday, the ecumenical group Churches Alive in Man have organised a special event. Called Praying for the Nation, it'll take place at the foot of Tinwald Hill in St John's on the evening of Thursday, July the 6th, starting at 7 o'clock. All are welcome to gather to offer prayers for our island, for those who lead the nation, and for families, friends and neighbours. St Catherine's Church in Port Erin start their series of summer concerts this week. As usual, they'll be each Thursday evening throughout the summer, starting at the usual time of a quarter to eight. Admission is free, there's an opportunity to donate to a retiring collection as you leave, and refreshments will be served in the hall next door to St Catherine's Church after each of the concerts. The first concert, this Thursday the 6th at a quarter to eight, will be given by Meadowside Choral Society. Russian Parish are hosting a flower festival from the 7th to the 13th of July in Kirk Christ. Entry is free, the church will be open daily and all the floral displays are being made by local community groups and they're all on a musical theme, definitely well worth a look. That's Russian Parish Church in Port Erin and the festival is open daily from July the 7th to July the 13th. On Saturday the 8th, the Ireland Spirituality Network have another morning meeting at St John's Mill. The speaker will be Reverend Dr Andrew Walker, an Anglican priest from the Diocese of London, and the title of his talk is Beginning the Song Exactly Where You Are. As always, there's a warm welcome for all to St John's Mill. 
No need to book, just come along. But please note that just for this month, the session will start at an earlier time of half past nine and finish at half past twelve. That's a time change just for this month only. And looking ahead to next Sunday, July the 9th, there's no morning service in Selby Methodist Church. Instead, the Salvation Army will be in concert next Sunday afternoon, starting at half past two. Admission is £7.50, including tea and cakes. That's in the Methodist Church in Selby next Sunday. And that brings us to the end of today's programme. And as I'm taking a little break just for this week, I won't be back tonight at nine o'clock. Instead, my thanks to Rianne Evans, who'll be opening the door to our virtual late lounge and welcoming you to sundown. And so, until we meet again, this is Judith saying thank you for listening and I wish you and those you love a blessed and happy week and a very good morning. Station, man's way.